Great. Um, so today we're going to continue talking about the uh, the big four, the the four things that are guaranteed to sink your relationship. So we've talked about defensiveness and criticism. Um, and I started with those two because <coughs> um, they're on the lighter end of the spectrum. Um, <laughs> because, they, because they have to do with what we say or how we receive what's said. The next two that we're going to talk about have a lot more to do with the feelings that we carry into the relationship. So today we're going to talk about stonewalling. Um, another word for stonewalling is uh, flooding. Or I should say flooding is a precursor to stonewalling. So what happens uh, when, when we stonewall is when we shut off access uh, to our affect, we shut off access to emotional information about us to our partner. Um, so that can happen with our body language. Like we may actually turn a shoulder to them. We may actually turn away. We may stop eye contact. Um, it may happen more in how we carry our body. So we may stop showing them emotion on our face. Um, we may stop responding with emotion in our voice and that's any emotion positive or negative. Um, you may be listening and thinking like that may be a good thing to shut off that access um, because sometimes I'm pretty overwhelmed with emotion. That's exactly why we shut off that access. It's a survival thing in our body. We're so overwhelmed with what's going on with us in the moment. We, we're feeling a lot. We actually, um, what is the word I, I want to look for? We, we undershoot. Um, we, we don't give all that information because we're feeling so much which is great for us. It's a survival technique uh, for us. What our partner though feels is um, dismissiveness or dissociation. So our partner feels really slighted um, by our stonewalling. And this is something when I work with, a, with couples on, I work with them to really understand and for the partner who, who stonewalls, um, I work with them to open up all of the emotion that's going on underneath them and they're their spouse is usually really shocked that there's that much feeling that goes on underneath because all they have on the surface is, you know, I was, I was talking about X, Y, Z, and all of a sudden you stopped caring. And we, we, we most often don't interpret that as you stopped caring about what I was saying is we interpret that as you stopped caring about me. Um, particularly when we stonewall during an argument um, or during a disagreement. And so it's important to, to notice for this um, in, in stonewalling that it feels like abandonment to our partner. And that's the problem. The problem is not that your body is responding to these overwhelming emotions and, and you're shutting down. That's exactly what your body probably needs to do. Um, it's recognizing that we need to do that with a bit of a, uh, we need to throw a safety line. We need to throw a, a life preserver to our partner. Um, and at the very least be able to say, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. I need to take a time out. Um, I'm, or, or even I'm getting angry right now or I'm getting overloaded right now and I don't want to do damage to our relationship by interacting with you out of this place. So the antidote to stonewalling is first of all, to be able to note that it's happening. So give your partner some clue. Um, I'm feeling really overwhelmed right now. I'm not sure what to say. Um, I'm feeling kind of blocked. I'm feeling kind of frozen, whatever that sounds like um, for you. And then to practice physiological self-soothing. So actually getting your body to calm down. And I think we've talked about timeout strategies here before. Um, this is where that 20 minute minimum timeout is really, really helpful. Um, that number comes from the research around what what kind of time it takes for our nervous system return to return to a more neutral state or a less elevated state it takes 20 minutes of not ruminating on whatever got us um, worked up in the first place in order to return to that. So a couple of, um, or several, several of these back, um, we did some, we did some webinars on soothing, like how we soothe within ourselves, how we soothe with another person. Those might be helpful to go back and watch if you're curious about um, what you would need to physiological self-soothe. Um, but it's about intentionally taking your nervous system experience from an elevated, I'm ready to fight or flight into a, I'm calmer. Um, and what that allows us to do is to return to the conversation, return to the situation with our partner, only this time we're grounded and we're not going to float out of the room or we're not going to turn our back because we're so overwhelmed with emotion. We may be able to come back and say, you know, when you said X, Y, Z, it really made me feel afraid or it really made me feel overwhelmed. So we can give our partner some useful information about how and when to meet us. Um, 
there was something else I was going to say about uh, stonewalling and flooding, but I'm forgetting now. So I'll pause there. Um, well, I have a question for you because when you're talking about, um, you know, it's shutting off affect, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that stonewalling is probably something, I mean, do you perceive that people who do that, that's something that they've learned to do throughout their life? Because I'm like, I would have a hard time believing that somebody who is like, wow, like me would mm -hmm. be able to turn around and, you know, completely shut down like that. And, yeah. Or, I think, I think that shutting down can look like a couple of, of different things. So for some people, it's that classic freeze response where like, um, they actually stop showing emotion on their face and may look like the thought process has actually stopped for others that shutting down may look like you just turned your momentum on a dime. So it may be, I went from really open and friendly and listening to now I'm very critical of you. Okay. Um, so it looks, it looks different for, for different people. And I do think that history or, you know, your, your upbringing, I think it really informs the kind of stonewalling you're prone to do. Um, but it's, it's again, the nervous systems, the nervous systems attempt to shut the influence of the other person out. So if I, so what I'm was also thinking of um, is if I'm shutting down, you know, am I uh, even going to be, like aware that I'm shutting myself down to protect myself and not uh, where I'm going with this is I was thinking like, okay, am, am I even going to be aware of this? Cause you're like, you know, um, uh, so, uh, so I have to be aware that I'm shutting things off. I'm feeling overwhelmed and mm -hmm. you know, am I just going to go into protective mode or am I going to be able to go? I'm, going, I'm starting to go to this place because I'm feeling overwhelmed and I'm going to quickly articulate this to the person I'm speaking with. Yeah. I'm gone. Initially, it's not likely that you'll be able to do that. Hopefully um, you get to that point where you get to know your shutting down patterns and maybe you work through some of the shame that comes with that. So that when you start shutting down, you could say, Hey, I'm getting really overwhelmed right now, or I'm feeling really small right now. Um, but initially I think it's a whole lot of like doing the autopsy. It's going back and saying the reason why I couldn't answer you or the reason why you were getting frustrated. My lack of participation is I was feeling like, um, I was feeling like I was talking to my dad again and I was in trouble. Um, so I, I think to, to get that skill to help you in the moment, you have to start by circling back to the situations where you were overwhelmed and you couldn't say anything or you couldn't do anything. And first of all, develop some effective strategies for yourself. Um, and second of all, um, develop some effective strategies or some helps for your partner so that they can understand what was happening for you. I'm thinking even being able to have a discussion of, of like afterwards saying, you know, like it was hard for me and doing the autopsy on it, but I'm even thinking it, it's like, what do you, what do you notice, you know, when I'm starting to do that, you know, if mm -hmm. I'm willing to ask for input, they may be able to start helping me identify, okay, you started looking away, you started, yeah. you, whatever the body language is, or, you know, or conversations stopped abruptly, whatever. So, yeah, no, that, and that can be incredibly helpful with somebody that you trust who's experienced that with you. Um, I think a big part of getting on top of stonewalling for, for lack of a better term is having insight into what it looks like on the outside of you when you're doing it. Um, because at the very least, like I know for me, when I start to get overwhelmed, I break eye contact and having gotten that, that um, feedback from a lot of people when I can start to feel overwhelmed. If I want to stay present in that conversation, I lock eyes and I, I make sure that I, I recenter and I revisit so I can stay present in that conversation. Another thing that I've, I've gotten feedback on is that I don't have an approachable face, that it's hard. Um, it's hardened. And so one of the things that I really work on when I, um, especially when I'm feeling a lot of emotion is I try to unfreeze my face. Um, I try to at the very least make sure it's soft and inviting. Um, if I'm really connected with my emotions and really feeling safe, I can show things like sadness, anxiety, um, things like that. But yeah, that, that asking for feedback on how your body looks is a really great way to start changing that dynamic. I could also see it being helpful because if, if somebody's invited me to help them, 
you know, notice that if I start noticing that, you know, I might be able to say, you know, I'm wondering if you're feeling overwhelmed right now, like kind of um, being able to support, you know, how can we deescalate this? Do you need 20 minutes? I mean, whatever to, to help them maybe intervene on the, on the process a little bit. Yeah, and that's, that I would say is what that looks like when this starts being transferred from something that is likely to um, end our relationship and do damage to a connecting moment. Like when you get to know your partner's patterns around stonewalling and you guys have done enough work in some supportive couples therapy where you can know the vulnerable child that's underneath that or the vulnerable story that's underneath that. Um, you know, I <clears throat> it probably took about eight years into my marriage before I could accept that um, I can make my spouse feel like she's in trouble with her dad. And that's what comes up with her. Um, And so getting that now I know the visual cues and I can, I can see when she's feeling small and I can, I can tell her, Hey, I'm, I'm going to back off from this a bit, or I probably hit that a little too directly or a little too, um, a little too bluntly. Like, let me phrase that another way. Um, so we can really help where I can even, I can even get more to the point and I can say, where are you feeling powerless in this? Um, and I can help to draw her out. And she knows, she knows my tells too, you know, so um, that can be a great relationship asset when, when the culture of the relationship is we really want to help each other. Um, we want to stay connected even, even when it's tough. So we have a couple questions. Um, my husband would stonewall me for weeks to punish me because I was asking for my needs to be met. Needs like having a conversation, needing to feel valued over his computer games and porn. I would think stonewalling would be different than feeling overwhelmed emotionally. Is there a difference? So that's a great question. Um, stonewalling is the product of feeling overwhelmed emotionally. So um, what what's behind stonewalling, what's behind the shutoff is I don't know what to do with all these emotions that I'm having. And so it's essentially, I'm just going to disconnect from this relationship um, interaction. So, um, and I would say that stonewalling is different than punishing. Punishing is an intentional carrying out of creating distance for our partner to, to give them the signal that what they did, we, we don't like. Um, stonewalling is a completely physiological response. So punishment may start in some stonewalling. Um, you know, it may start in that physiological overwhelm, but if there's a, if there's a lack of ability to circle back and to say, Hey, um, video games make a whole lot more sense to me than your needs that are varying all the time. And I feel safer in that world because it's more predictable to me. And I don't have the set of relationship skills. I, I need to show up for you as a partner. That's a very vulnerable conversation to have. And, you know, I've, I've seen, I've seen individuals, I'm, I'm thinking of someone uh, specifically that I've worked with who, who just about called off her, her engagement to the love of her life um, because she was having a hard time admitting that she was embarrassed at her initial response to a difficult conversation. And so she kept doubling down. She was, she was stonewalling on her fiance and she continued to push him until she, she said it, it took like physical strength to get the words out of her mouth. I'm really embarrassed about how I responded to you in the beginning. And then all of a sudden the wall came down for her and they could have this vulnerable conversation. Um, But it took a lot of bravery for her to do that. And her tendency in the past would be to punish her partner for her feeling embarrassed about her lack of skill. Um, So yeah, stonewalling is the product of feeling overwhelmed emotionally. Um, but it is not the same as intentionally carrying out punishment because we're too proud to come back and say, I actually don't know what to do with what you're bringing to me. Yeah. Well, and with that, yeah, I I don't know if there's any room to say, you know, uh, to invite that conversation that, you know, if he's pushing back and distancing, you know, I don't know if there's a space to be willing to ask, you know, like, yeah. You know, are, are you afraid of my needs? You know, what is, what is the challenge here that, you know, I, I found we- in situations like that, it, it takes connection, I think with a sponsor or a therapist to help them get at that vulnerability in the beginning. It's a lot less risky for me to be vulnerable with my therapist or my sponsor than it is to be vulnerable with my spouse. Um, you know, so I hope to head in that direction where all of my innate vulnerabilities I can take to my spouse first. But in the meantime, I have safe people I can practice that with. And usually 
you know, before I take something big and vulnerable to my spouse, I've at least talked to my therapist and or my sponsor um, to kind of like have a rehearsal <laughs> to, to be able to really lock in the sense like this will not be the end of the world. I will be okay. Um, so yeah, that, I think that's, that's a difficult conversation as the spouse who this is being do, done to, to invite that conversation in the beginning. So I, I hope your, I hope your husband's getting individual support. I hope you guys are getting marital support. So next uh, question is, in relationships, I'm usually the one being stonewalled and I find it overwhelming. My dad seems to live in the state and it really triggers my panic. And in all my relationships before recovery, I seem to be the with people who enjoy seeing me um, uh, this way as if it gave them a sense of enjoyment from uh, revenge. I haven't been in a relationship since recovery and I have left friendships where uh, which were like this. So I don't really know how I would react in the situation. I hope it changed. The stonewalling felt like purposefully feeling ignored. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes back to what you were talking about. If it's like always, that's different than stonewalling, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a couple points here. One of the stories in our head, one of the stories we tell ourselves can be this person is doing this to me on purpose. Um, one of the reasons why I work with couples on stonewalling is because we need to find out if it's being done on purpose. And we also need to find out where the actual emotional thresholds are. Um, so if it's being done on purpose, that would be abusive. And, um, you know, I, I have that conversation with couples that this is abusive and it needs to stop. Um, you, you can't hang your partner out to dry for three weeks because they made a request of you that you didn't like. Um, so that can actually happen. It can also be how we, how we perceive it. And so that's where I think when we're less triggered, when we're less overwhelmed, or when we see that person open to go back and to say, were you aware that you did this? Were you aware this was happening? Were you aware that it felt this way for me? Um, because if that person is, is generally wanting to be connect with, connected with us and they're physiologically overwhelmed, they're gonna feel terrible. Um, that you felt that way. They're going to feel terrible that you felt abandoned. No, I didn't want you to feel abandoned. I had no idea what to say. I felt like, felt like the stakes were so high in getting this wrong, I froze. Um, if, if that person is doing that intentionally, they're probably not going to like it that you are, are onto the playbook. Um, and you may see more defensiveness. You may see some gaslighting. Um, so that's, that's really important to check out what the intent is. And again, that's where, if this is your, your partner, I think some supported couples work can really help you um, to distinguish. Um, but yeah, if, if, if it's purposely being ignored, that's abusive. Um, that's, that's intentionally abusive. That's not, um, that's not being overwhelmed. Um, I would be left in a small child mode, racking my brains to find out what I did wrong, working hard to work on how to fix things and begging for interaction to take place again. Uh, thus forgetting what I had brought up and it, it asking me, or, and it me asking for forgiveness. So I am making, I think, and making me ask for forgiveness. So, mm -hmm. so what I'm hearing is that if I have needs and I'm trying to express them, it gets turned back around. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that again is part of the skill set here. All of us are going to be in relationships with partners who overwhelm, who get overwhelmed and, and who stonewall. And part of allowing your partner to come back around to the relationship is we have to be able to tolerate the discomfort of that, you know? So think of the, think of the habit that's set up between a parent and a child. If um, I, I think about this because I had this this morning with my six year old, um, he was throwing a fit because we didn't have the exact kind of syrup that he happened to want that this, that morning or this morning. And it wasn't like we always have the syrup and we didn't today. It's like, he's like, I want the one in the lady bottle. I'm like, where did you get that? We never buy Aunt Jemima syrup. So he's throwing a big fit. And um, it had gotten to the point where he was like hitting and kicking because he does that when he's really upset. So I put him in a timeout. Um, he had to experience that separation in order to calm down, but also to recognize his behavior was out of line. And I could talk to him about that. Now, if I were taking responsibility for that, I would have gotten in the car, I would have gone to a grocery store and I would have bought that syrup that he wanted right away. Um, 
what that would have set up is that would have told him, this is what it takes to get dad to listen to you. Um, this is what it takes to get what you want. So again, in our relationships, if we have amends to make, we need to make them. Um, we, we need to look at that. We need to not leave our partner out to dry. But if we're making amends to make the tantrum go away, um, we're contributing to a relationship that's tantrum based. It's intensity based rather than intimacy based, rather than needs based. Um, but as, as little children, sometimes that's the only thing that we can offer is I'll take on the blame for this just so you calm down. Um, as adults, maybe we can tolerate a little more upset, a little more distance in our partner than we could as children. Well, yeah, and I feel for you when you're talking about, you know, I'm left racking my brain what I did wrong. And so constantly looking at what, what, what could I possibly have done wrong when the other people are clearly not taking any ownership that there's an issue. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so can stonewalling happen during addictive behavior? I feel like my partner was stonewalling when I was feeling super insecure about his actions. He completely shut off emotionally and refused to talk anything out. Yeah, I would say that addiction is an extreme case of stonewalling. Um, most of the folks that I work with who are struggling with addiction are very neurologically dysregulated. Um, and they tend to choose addictions that isolate them, that kind of put them in this tunnel vision. And that, that reduces a lot of the chatter, that reduces a lot of the access. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, uh, I think stonewalling and addictive behavior go together. Um, and that's, that's, you know, for, for a lot of the couples that I work with, the reason why the relationship is in jeopardy may be less about the specific betrayal and it may be more about the lack of availability from their partner. And that's where I see the addicts that I work with, that's where they've got the harder work to do is to become an available partner, not just to stop the, um, the destructive behavior. So the, the, she adds, now all my partner wants to do is speak and talk about emotions while he's in recovery. How is it possible for someone to have these two sides? So um, I'll give you the story from my, my life. It's a little more of a silly example, but um, I think it highlights. Um, so I, gr I grew up in a home that was really messy. It was very chaotic. We had pets. And so because it was a messy home that wasn't attended to and it was chaotic, we had pet hair everywhere. And I was extremely embarrassed about every article of clothing that I wore was covered in cat or dog hair. So I vowed that as soon as I got my own space, um, no non-human mammal would ever live in it. Um, and um, it was to the point that when I was dating my wife, it was, it was probably the first serious deal breaker conversation we had. Um, her parents had cats, but her parents also attended to their house. So they would clean up hair and things like that. And I, um, this is probably a few months into dating. I said, I need to know, like, do you have to live with cats in the house or do you have to live? Her family had had dogs before too. It's like, do you have to have a mammal? And she's like, I like it, but I guess I don't have to. And I said, let me be very clear. That would be a deal breaker for me if you had to have a mammal in the house. And, um, she was like, well, I don't, I don't really care that much about it. So, okay. So fast forward um, nine years into our marriage. And um, I came home from a therapy session one day. I'd been working on um, some, I've been doing some trauma work through EMDR with my therapist. And I came home and the first word, she said, how was therapy? And the first words out of my mouth were, I think I want a dog. <laughs> I think I said, I said, I think I would really enjoy um, taking care of uh, an animal and having that kind of companionship. And so I, I picked her up off the floor and she was like, why the big change? And I said, um, she's like, were you focusing on that in therapy? And I said, no, no. But what I was focusing on was feeling overwhelmed by other people's needs. And I think I'm separate from that now. And so I could actually really welcome this. And that's something that I've noticed. It wasn't just the dog that made that change, but in a lot of my relationships, I was so anti-dependency and so anti-people leaning on me because I didn't have a say in that growing up. I didn't have a say in that earlier. Um, and so people who knew me would say, well, when you really, really get to know him, he's a really nice guy. Um, he, he's really open. He's caring. Um, and that always bothered me because I'm like, no, you don't have to really, really get to know me. That is who I am. But I protected that. 
as soon as as soon as I had the ability to say no and kind of control that access, I opened up the floodgates. Like um, my my now nine year old, his his first comment on my relationship with the dog was two weeks in, and he said to my wife, he said, "You and Dad are really weird with the dog." And he said, "No, Dad's really weird with the dog. Like, why does he talk to her like a baby, and why does he always want to hold her?" It's because I loved that complete dependency. Um, I I thrived with that. So I think there's a lot in our, a a lot of what we absolutely can't do in addiction is um, something that I think we've been really hurt by. And it's not something that we necessarily hate. It's that it was completely unsafe for us. You know, so I would wonder with your partner, did he have people or she did, did your partner have people that they could open up to um, and talk about emotional things? you may be experiencing they've been through the desert and now they found water and now they can't get enough of it. Like, I want to talk to you about everything because there's finally a safe person that they can do that with. And I think that's a, I think that's a beautiful change that can come out of recovery. Um, and it, I, I see those kind of changes happen all the time for folks. And I can imagine that it feels like, you know, the, the complete 180 of like, you didn't say anything and now you say, everything. you know, so, but, you know, I totally agree with what, what you're saying. When I first um, got into recovery, you know, I was like, ah, and, and somebody said, what are you feeling? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just feeling, and I hated it. I didn't, mm-hmm. I couldn't identify. I had so shut off every emotion. Um, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and we we're talking about, you know, you know, this person said, well, I like to laugh. And I was like, well, laughter is detached. I could, I could laugh even, you know, in that time, but to feel, you know, happy, sad, whatever, I really was disconnected from that. So I had to learn that. And, um, you know, I do talk a lot about emotions. I don't think every single moment is talking about emotions, but I do relate on a much more honest basis than just in my head, you know, because I can think differently than feel. So I really do try to relate to people on what is, you know, what is my true feelings about this, not what I intellectualize, I should say, or whatever. So, um, so anyway, so, so yes, I think that is true. I have a feeling your partner's in earlier recovery. It does get better. Um, You know, we also learn how to not vomit our emotions on every single person. <laughs> yeah. Not everybody really cares about how we feel. So right. Better, so. I always, I always tell, love to hear how you feel. So. I always tell my folks early in recovery when they get involved in support groups, in, inevitably they'll come back to me and like, I tried to make friends with so-and-so and it just went bad and I told them way too much. And I, I always think about how, um, you know, that experience of going into a room where people are committed to being open and honest. And then we have to remind ourselves that not everybody gets into relationships for this reason. Only addicts early in recovery get into relationships for this reason because we need it. Yeah. We're, we're really cut off, but I, I would echo what Tammy says that does get better over time. And, you know, we, we do get to a place where we're not dying of emotional thirst anymore. Um, yeah, that's it's definitely a kink that will work out hopefully. So going back to the first one where you suggested marriage counseling, it was the, the punishing, I'm not going to talk to you for three weeks. So no marriage counseling made it worse. He would manipulate me and the counselor. She even told me that I should watch porn with him because he made it seem like I was being unreasonable about it. He would treat me like I uh, was a game he played uh, through and he had no use for me. It felt like he chose porn over me. We aren't in counseling. Yeah, all of these skills that we're talking about, all of these, um, you know, the antidotes to the relationship killers, they require a, um, they require a, an ability and a desire to be vulnerable with your partner. Um, And some people, I think, can be so insecure, they can be so threatened, um, that they may never, their desire threshold for the relationship may never, um, we never invite them into that level of vulnerability. Um, some people are so defended and so protected. Um, and you know, that's, it, it makes me sad when I hear you say you would treat me like a game that he played through. Um, he had no use for me. He chose porn over, porn over me. Um, some people are that defended and um, th- there may not be, there may not be an apparent path forward for them in not becoming that defended. I think that's a personal choice that people make. 
Um, and, and some people, unfortunately, may not get to the point where they make that choice, where they've decided that it's worth it to be vulnerable. It's worth it to open themselves up to risk in order to connect deeply. And as much as I have benefited from therapy and I have a lot of great therapists that are um, my friends and colleagues. Um, not every therapist does a great job and yeah. some can be manipulated. And yeah. you know, I, I hate when, um, I mean, this is why we talk about making sure you have a qualified therapist to help you um, because yeah, the easy solution is, Oh, you're part of the problem. If you just watch porn with him, then, you know, everything will be fine, you know, and you're being unreasonable. Well, no, you're not, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Rob talks about in out of the doghouse about how to rebuild trust. And clearly he was looking for somebody to take his side rather than, mm -hmm. you know, helping rebuild trust in a relationship. And, and I feel sad. I feel sad about the whole situation. And, and um, you know, I know it's difficult for you. Um, I feel really sad for him because, yeah. you know I'm sorry but being attached to porn and uh, gaming and things like that is I mean that that's not real attachment you know that's you know at the end of the day it's artificial and it's out there and it's not a real person that actually cares about you so so sad all the way around that you know he's choosing not to do something that would make his life and yours and your mm -hmm. really better so yeah so uh, there's a comment. Um, I'm starting to find this balance has been a learning curve. She also had mentioned about the um, a defi uh, definitely abusive and would be gaslighting her son. And this is the gal with the teenage son used to do this, but had, but with some therapy owned it and has been changing. Yay. So that's, that's a win. A therapist. That's a win. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, having, you know, I, and, you know, I applaud you for, you know, hanging in there with that. Cause I, I remember you sharing in a previous uh, session too, that, you know, it's new and, you know, the guilt of, you know, not being as great of a parent as you would have liked to be. And, you know, finding that new balance, but, you know, it sounds like you're making progress and you're both showing up in a different way. It's, that's I, think, I think one of the ultimate litmus tests in a relationship, um, whether or not this relationship is going to be something that benefits both of us and is a healthy place for both of us is when we become aware of our relationship damaging behavior, um, either side, if we see ourselves adjust, if we see ourselves have that kind of like, oh no, I can't believe I did that response, or I don't want to keep doing that response, that is a great asset for the relationship. And likely that behavior is going to be changing. That behavior will adjust. Um, and it sounds like there's some of that, you know, in what you mentioned with your son, just bringing that to awareness, hey, this isn't working for me, or this is how this makes me feel, or this is what happens to our relationship. With that changing, he's he's probably recognizing some of the costs of the relationship. Um, and that's a great asset to have in the relationship. Sometimes we put that out there and, um, you know, like one of the previous people said, sometimes that's not met with, oh my gosh, how can I change? Um, and like I said, that's an important litmus test. I think it tells you a lot about, um, a lot about the trajectory of the relationship based on on those responses. Can we get open and vulnerable and remorseful or do we double down and get more defended? And that's really why I wanted to talk about these four horsemen. We'll finish the, the last one next week is because it really points to how we commonly defend ourselves in the most harmful ways for relationships. And when we can recognize that, we can sidestep that a little bit with some vulnerability. She adds, things are working really well and all the skills I've learned here have been helping so much. We have a whole new, re new relationship and I'm seeing him open up, express his views and we have fun again. That's awesome. I'm very happy for you. Yeah. You know, and I can't help but think, you know, so he's seeing you in a different way and you, you're both having fun and that's a positive reinforcement for both of you as well that, you know, if we continue to take these steps, being vulnerable, not getting it right all the time, none of yep. us do, you know, but if we just keep, you know, showing up and, and, and trying, you know, then uh, things improve. And, and I love, um, oh, you know, you're teaching him, um, a different way to relate so that mm -hmm. as he gets to be an adult, he can take that into future relationships as well. So that he can really show up for, you know, a partner in a different way. So any other questions, comments? We've got some time. 
any requests for um, webinars in the future too? We're taking those. I've added a couple to the list. So let's talk about, I know you've got the intensive coming up. Do you still have space in your? Yeah, we've still got, we've still got seats for the July Mother and Mesh Men Intensive uh, near Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, so this is the first time we've offered one in the summer. So we're hoping that I'll speak to folks who are busy the other nine months of the year and um, could spend some time there. I'm really looking forward to um, getting in that ritual space again and helping men break free from guilt obligations and moving into relationships that they can be fully present for and fully choosing. So I've listened to the TFS podcast and wonder if you could talk on a few comments I heard you touch on there, effective apologies. Um, yeah, I'll prepare something uh, to talk a little more about effective apologies. Um, actually, I could talk a little bit about that right now. Um, just like we're talking about with uh, these four horsemen, um, the key with each one of these, I think, is to be really clear about what happened and then to take corrective action. Um, and, and to me, that's the heart of an effective apology. Just a blanket, I'm sorry, um, I don't think it covers it because usually what the person we're apologizing to is looking for is a knowledge um, of what happened. And if we're aware of what happened, I think we can actually be committed to not letting that happen again, or at least taking remedial action uh, quicker. Um, so, I think in an effective apology, we really have to own what it is we did. We have to be able to um, start to empathize with how that might have felt to the other person. The actual words, I'm sorry, are actually important. That's part of the social ritual around um, coming back together after rupture. Um, yeah, so that would, that, would be my, uh, that would be my at a glance effective apologies. If there's specific questions on effective apologies, I'd be happy to answer those. I'm going to share too, because I'm sorry, to me, gets overused. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I love the, you know, I, I know I hurt you when da, 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 or I could say whatever. I think that's really important. Or, uh, but I also, um, I have found that please forgive me, you know, mm -hmm. was really helpful for me. There was one situation, this is years ago, and um, it was a colleague that I worked with, and I don't even remember what I did, but she said, I forgive you. And it was different at me, like just having that, um, her, her forgiveness on some, I don't know, it was a minor thing, but just the way she said it, I was like, wow, that felt really healing to me. So, so I've learned to, you know, I say I'm sorry too, but, um, uh, but, and I mean it, um, I think that's a, the other thing, cause there's a lot of people that do the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, lip service, but not, you know, mm -hmm. there's no intention of ever changing just, Oh, sorry, you know, and, uh, kind of flip about it. And so I think for me, it's like, please forgive me. I'm, I'm asking them, um, I, I, I want them to hear that I'm sincere. I'm intentional. Yeah. I've owned what I'm doing. They cannot forgive me. I mean, that's entirely up to them, but you know, I'm, I am asking for the next step to help bridge that for our relationship as well. And that, that was an element in, in the research I read um, that was also a necessary part of an effective apology is asking for reconciliation or asking for forgiveness. Because what that indicates, when we really get to that place, it indicates that we do want to repair the relationship and that we understand that it's not, it's not our call whether or not this relationship continues as it was. It's, it's really the other person's decision because we've wronged them um how women become defensive with each other in a male dominated environments i'm ex-military and the men objectified us shamed us and made us feel like we were dangerous because of our feminism they could help themselves red-blooded male and they wouldn't be forced to do predatory behavior if it wasn't for having to work with us in my experience it is hard to make female friends as they uh, there seemed to be so much hostility between each other and never supported each other. We turned it on each other. I am so with you on that. I, in fact, I was just telling my husband this the other day. I said, you know, it's like, you know, the hashtag me too. Um, uh, you know, like, we, yes, you know, we should be 
women should be giving each other the hand up rather than it feels like we're on the ladder and we're taking our high heels and, you know, mm -hmm. like they've got their hands and we're going, yes, you know, you're down. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, I don't, I don't want to be like that. I want it to be, you know, I want to help other women. You know, I, I think, you know, in any relationship, we're stronger if we're together, you know, and, yeah. Uh, you know, but, but uh, I've got granddaughters and I, you know, they're at an age and the girls are mean. And I just, mm -hmm. I hate that, you know, boys will punch each other and get over it, but girls are mean. And I think that that's unfortunate. And I think that we've tolerated that in, you know, our society, we don't intervene on that, that at a younger age. And then that just, you know, we have to feel like we're competitive if we want to get ahead and, um, I mean, be an empowered woman. I don't know. That's I'm rambling. Yeah. It really is one of my things. I don't like it. This isn't quite in my area of expertise, but I would recommend, um, I forget who the author was, but the book is Queen Bees and Wannabes. Um, and it's a very in-depth look at uh, what she calls mean girl culture. Actually, the movie from 15 years ago, Mean Girls, mm -hmm. was based on her research. Um, and that was actually one of the reasons why um, I think it was Tina Fey who made the movie. Um, one of the reasons why she wanted to make it was to make this known that this happens and it's a very like, you could almost say it's like a structured part of our society and there's reasons why it happens. Um, again, I, I can't remember the, the name of the author, but as with most things, I think the more we know about it, uh, the more we know about how it works and why it works, the more power we have over it. Um, and that's definitely something that, um, you know, I, I grew up in a home of four sisters and one brother. Um, and that's something that I, my brother and I have a very different relationship than my four sisters have. Um, they spend a lot of time together and they do a lot together, but you get any one of them alone and they're very critical of the other three, any one of them. And so even in our family, you know, that that happened. And it's something that, um, you know, like you were saying, Tammy, it makes me really sad um, to, to see as well, because I, I think from a, um, from a support perspective, the, the best person to support you is someone who has been through what you've been through. And we definitely see that in, um, I think we see that in, in a lot of female relationships, not just in male dominated, um, environments, um, but a lot of female relationships where it's, it's hard to come to terms with the fact that we can be supportive with each other. And I think that's something that culturally really gets um, reinstated over and over again. And uh, I would really like to see changes in our culture around that. Yeah. And I think we have to start with our young girls, you know, mm -hmm. like my granddaughter's aging, you know, and I don't know how to all do that because there's, you know, it's too pervasive, but yeah. you know, I mean, it's just like my, my uh, granddaughter, play soccer and she's really good so then the other girls don't like her because she's mm -hmm. really good and I'm like you know why would you not go it's great to be on a team with somebody like this you know versus we're gonna shut you out we're gonna be mean to you because mm -hmm. you know, you're a little bit younger and you're playing at our you know I just I don't get it so yeah but Oh, this, there's a comment. Uh, my husband says, I'm sorry. What he really means is I'm sorry you are upset and bothered by my behavior. Yes, um, that would not be a real apology. <laughs> a, a real apology is I'm sorry for my actions that caused you to feel. Um, it's, it's complete responsibility for our part. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of us, uh, I, I know that was the loophole I learned around apologies as a kid. I'm sorry you feel that way. Sounds like a very sincere apology, but it's really it's really not. Oh, I hear very dismissive. I'm sorry you yeah. feel that way. No? Yeah. On you, it's not on me. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Great arrangement for me who's done the hurting, but not a really good arrangement for the person I've hurt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and like I said, I know too many people that just use I'm sorry. It's like, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. But there's no intention of changing things or really looking at how you know how, how can I not do this or have it repeat it was it was really interesting a few years ago I was working with a couple on a disclosure process and um it was the the wife was the addict and um or the wife struggled with addiction and one of the things that she said when she gave her reconciliation letter she said in the beginning I I didn't think that saying I'm sorry 56 times was going to cut it and she even had said to her sponsor at one point, how many different ways can you say I'm sorry? And as she started connecting more empathetically with her husband's experience, 
um, and what he had been saying to her through his, his impact letter and, and that part of the, the disclosure process. She said, I found that the words, I'm sorry, not only took on new meaning, but I found a lot of different ways to say it. Um, I felt a lot of, I, I found authentic ways for me to express connection with his grief, which is really what I'm sorry is. It's an attempt to connect authentically with the other person's grief because of our actions. And I, I still think of that letter often as um, there were some really beautiful ways that she indicated um, her remorse for her actions and the impact on her, her spouse. But it, she got to all those ways by focusing on his experience and focusing on his pain that she had caused. Well, and it takes, uh, it takes a lot more to be able to empathize and to be able to feel the hurt that, you know, that I've caused somebody and to be sincerely, you know, caring about that than to just give the lip service and do the, I'm sorry, you feel that way. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, comment. Uh, really, this is a cop out. I have a friend who uh, does this. I feel annoyed, but if I voice it, they say that I'm being awkward and I leave feeling guilty. So I've been feeling I'm asking too much and that is too critical. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, those, those are tough situations. I, again, like I, I think, you know, folks in recovery are geared to a, a little bit of a, a deeper look at the emotional inner workings of relationships. And it may be if these are the friends that you go and have a good time with, they may not be looking for that um, emotional interchange and they may not know what to do with it when it goes to an emotional interchange. Um, this is where I, I don't know if this is the uh, subversive part of me or the direct relational part of me, but situations like this uh, put me in a mind to say something like, don't worry so much about my feelings, just worry about your behavior and we'll do better. <laughs> um, but I, I, yeah, it's, it's hard. And I, I would say in most relationships, it's really important to pick the battles that are important. This may be the critical battle in this relationship. And if it is, one of the casualties of that battle is there may be a little bit of disconnection, a little bit of friction between you and this friend as you're making your feelings known. And as you're insisting that they, that they see those feelings as valid, that they meet you there if they want to, if they want to keep a good relationship with you. Um, if it's one of those things, it's like, they'll never get this. They don't even understand what I'm saying. It may not be the critical thing. So, you know, these, these may be friends that you expect when you go out with them, you'll be annoyed with how they deal with emotion and trespass. Um, but maybe the fun you have together is, is more beneficial than the annoyance you feel. And you may, you may not arrange for a lot of opportunities to be together with them because of how that does hurt you. Um, so you know, I, I think calling this kind of stuff out and asking for change definitely is awkward. But if it's if it's a relationship that's worth it doing and it's definitely worth the effort, I would say. And, and I have different friends on different levels. But I also um, was thinking that early in my recovery, like I transitioned through a lot of people as I had the ability to show up in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so there were people that weren't going to be able to meet me in that level and that was fine you know and if I saw them on the street that was fine whatever but like I chose not to spend time with them because I was growing in a different way and I really feel like I was growing and uh, so if they were still here I had less in common with them and it, they didn't um, you know I've been intentional about the people I want to spend time with so I want to spend time you know, fostering deeper relationships. Does everything have to be heavy and dramatic? No, I want to go, yeah. you know, I want to go bowling. I want to go bowling and we can, you know, maybe that's a bowling friend. You just go bowling, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, I think that you end up kind of with, these are friends I do this with, these are friends I do this with, and I have different expectations, you know, based on who it is and how I can show up for them and they can show up for me, you mm -hmm. know, on those different relationships. Definitely. Any other questions or comments? Well, then I guess we will hope to see all of you next week. This will this recording will be placed on the website for future viewing. Um, but we'll see you next week. Where we're what what are we going to talk about next week? Since we've gone through defensiveness, criticism, stonewalling, what's the fourth one? The granddaddy of all four horsemen, contempt. Um, this is my favorite because it shows up in so many places. And once you become a 
a master observer of content, um, contempt, um, you can really, uh, I think you can really leverage that awareness into some great relationship experiences. So I'm looking forward to it next week. There you go. Okay. See y'all okay. next week. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye.